All right, good evening, everybody. Um, we're going to start. I officially call um, the meeting uh, open. Um, my name is Zachary Karen. I'm the chairman of the board. Uh, to my left, uh, we have Nicole Skylison, who's our office manager, Greg Logan, uh, the vice chair, Jason Quinn, the clerk, Jonathan Gale, who's a member, Michelle Lima, who's a member, Peter Karen, who's a member, and Margaret Mitchell. She is the attorney for the um, town zoning board. And uh, first, if we could all please rise for the uh, pledge of allegiance. Okay, and uh, before we get into the business here, um, I just want to state for the public and for uh, the camera and for the board as well, our next meeting for this case, uh, based on everyone's availability that we all have, is going to be Tuesday. October 15th at 7 p.m. and that will be here. 7 p.m. correct. Okay, um, so before we begin, um, I feel the first thing I want to address is the um, site visit that did not that did not go as planned. I'm sure that is something. Um, as far as I know, every board every. Uh, a butter was notified about how the visit did not go through his plan. I just want to address um, that. So what had happened? What happened was um, there wasn't going to be enough visibility from the road or any entrance point for the public to see anything besides um, some brush and trees. And due to the fact that there was no parking there, we didn't feel comfortable um, for safety concerns having the police shut down part of the road or block off part of the road for uh, traffic. Uh, for parking, just so the people could just stand on the curb and just look at some brush. Uh, we felt like it wasn't fair to tie up the, um, the town's money with that or the public's time because I didn't want, personally, I didn't want anybody to show up to that meeting and say, well, you know, there's nothing really here for us to see. Um, make sure um, I hear you guys do want to discuss uh, future site visits and how we can go about doing that in the future. site visit uh, when we got the notice that it was canceled and uh, it, it was actually as, as I think you know a surprise to us um, we understood the concern regarding a uh, lack of availability for parking at the site so our proposed solution for that is to come up with some common meeting space where maybe we could all meet at uh, town hall or meet in this parking lot and then if uh, maybe a couple days before the scheduled site visit we had a general sense of uh, the number of people that wanted to attend. We could either just shuttle people to the site using Fisher's vehicles, vehicles from his company, or uh, we could rent a van um, and have people shuttle to the site. So that was how we proposed to resolve concerns about uh, a lot of people parking right on the road. The other concern about what's visible and what's not visible um, so generally what we do with site visits is uh, we'll mark the roadway with, or the proposed road for the site with uh, stakes. Uh, the surveyor goes out there, trudges through the brush, and marks the road. Um, I've never seen anything beyond that. Site visits are generally uncomfortable uh, experiences where you are trudging through brush, and unless you have um, you know, an engineering background or a sense of the site, there really isn't that much that you can, can garner from it. Um, so we generally don't go through the trouble of clear cutting a site just so you can see what it looks like. We generally preserve the vegetation. Um, so, you know, so long as everyone understands that the site visit is going to be trudging through brush, and there's, there are some areas that, you know, are heavily wooded, uh, they're welcome to attend, obviously, at their own risk, and we can get them to the site, uh, you know, by the method that I proposed. Okay, thank you. I mean, I just want to make sure you guys did understand my concerns, though. I just didn't want people showing up and finding out what we can't walk in there and see anything. So I just wanted to make sure, I, wanted, I didn't want anyone to come up and feel like that their time was wasted, that's all. Okay, yeah. Okay, 
thank you. Uh, so do we want to, I, I know you started with the scheduling. Do we want to talk scheduling? Sure. While, um, while we're on the subject. I, I know, you know, you mentioned October 15th, um, which is another two months from now. Um, and we had a little bit of an interval uh, between the last hearing and today, and obviously summer vacations and, and schedules and whatnot, so that's understandable. But generally, during the interval, there's a little bit more um, in terms of communication, either from the board's experts or from town personnel or additional comments from additional boards. Um, and I know that there were uh, comments that were generated from other boards, formal comments, yeah. um, that we just received this evening. And totally understandable these right. things happen, um, but I think you know, maybe if we can really maybe plan out a roadmap with dates pursuant to which things might be submitted and circulated, and then also yes. we could talk about um, having a work session, uh, at least with one member of the board, uh, to discuss what's discussed tonight, some of the comments that we've received from other boards, Correct. some yep. of the comments we've received from abutters, and maybe we can schedule that as well. Sure, um, uh, but, but both of which we're, uh, we're only planning uh, to discuss that as well. Um, I've decided that uh, to allow any, everyone here on the board time to look at documents, whether it's from abutters or whether it's from you guys or from other, or from other town boards, um, two weeks before the um, public hearing, um, would be the deadline to submit something. Does that sound reasonable for you guys? For the public hearing? Yes. Um, yeah, so I think what I would like to understand first is would there be an opportunity for a work session Yes. during that interval? And then, because my concern is that depending on the date of the work session, we may want to revise plans further. Right. And then from there, could be presented two weeks prior to the October 15th hearing and then we could have a nice productive hearing on the 15th. Okay, um, so that being said, um, just, so, just so we're clear here, every, uh, everyone here on the board, only the voting members are sh should be attending, uh, not should be, but um, uh, at least one should, should be coming to the meeting, so if it doesn't work for everybody, that's okay. Yeah, so we're going by the dates that are on, on, on our plane right here, right in front of us. Um, How's the, easy, the, the the second week of September for you guys? The um, uh, the two dates that are work for everybody here on the board would be either the tenth or the twelfth. That would be the uh, uh, Tuesday and the third uh, Tuesday or um, or Thursday. Any particular time? I mean, generally sometimes they're during the day. Yes, when is September? Uh, the tenth or the twelfth. It's the second week of September, the week of the ninth. That that work for you guys? Driscoll's bill. And I assume evening will work best for everybody. Six o'clock. Six o'clock? Okay. Yeah, six All right, so why don't we do um, the six o'clock on the 12th work? That would work. Okay. So um, and just, that would, it would be a town hall? Yes, yep. Okay. So, uh, so September 12th, 6 p.m., be our first working session. One Right. Yep. And the public's invited, but they're not, there's no public input. Right. So that just, just to be clear for anyone who didn't hear that, the public can attend those meetings. There's just no public input given at that time. So you can come and take notes, hear whatever you'd like to hear. We just, at that, at those meetings, we um, save uh, the public hearing for when the um, virus cannot um, give any kind of input. So you are all are welcome to attend. It's just, at uh, th that point, it's just strictly for the board and the developer to be discussing anything we need to discuss. A single member of the board, and, and yep. just every board has different procedures and, and protocols as far as work sessions and how they like to do it. Uh, what I found productive, just so that there's a, a very clear process for anyone that's interested uh, in terms of butters, is that the board votes to appoint one member this evening, and we know who that member is. That member is voted to attend a work session to discuss and hear what the applicant's thoughts are with respect to what has been discussed during the meeting. And then what usually happens is the member of the board gives a report to the board and to the abutters at the next public hearing and debriefs on the discussion and what was had. But it's, it should be made very clear, no decisions of any substance right. are made by that one board member. So yep. it's just an opportunity to try to work through technical aspects of the proposal that 
um, sort of require everybody to huddle around the plant, to huddle around uh, the pile of stormwater management couch and that sort of thing. Okay, so um, I'll make the motion that we appoint uh, Greg Logan. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right, sound good? Yep, that sounds good for scheduling and, and procedures. Okay, thank you. So the first thing I would like to read into the minutes. Um, yep. Oh yes, before we begin, I would just um, make a motion that by 9.30 we adjourn tonight. I'll second that motion. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So this was a, me um, a memo given uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals from Mallory, who is our town administrator. Uh, this is dated July 30th, 2019. After your first public hearing on, Char on the Charbery Fields development, I have the opportunity to discuss my original comments with the developer. These included increased protection for the wetlands and vernal pools in the area, as well as considering condominiums or some other type of homes rather than traditional single family homes. I cited Dighton's needs, uh, needs specifically for options for young professionals as well as the elderly looking to downsize yet remain in their hometown. Mr. Hashim seemed um, uh, uh, and with both to changing uh, the development from all single family homes to varying housing stock. He stated the Zoning Board of Appeals can provide a directive to him uh, to create an alternate concept that would take these concerns into account. In a second meeting, we further discussed an updated concept that I requested he share with the Zoning Board of Appeals. This included townhouses and a small cottage style type, uh, uh, a small cottage style development in addition to the single family homes. While this ultimately increases the total number of housing units originally proposed, there are increased protections for vernal pools, which I was extremely happy to see, and more green space areas throughout the entire development, including a wooded buffer between a few homes on, on Country Hill Drive and the proposed development. I have one remaining concern with this new concept, and that is that there are three different areas of the project. Perhaps this would constitute, at the mouse, a mass housing level, three separate projects. It is worth a call to town council to check if this new plan separated into three areas with three types of housing is something that would pass muster under Chapter 40B. That being said, the ZBA has expressed interest in seeing developers provide mixed housing stock, and I believe this plan does just that, offering differing um, options for a variety of potential homeowners. Um, so before we talk to the developer about um, their experience with this, what do you guys think about this? The next person that is over to the other side of the house doesn't maintain their property, it kind of gives you a problem that it doesn't fall on the developer's property, falls onto the committee. Um, so I'm not for townhouses. I do like the idea of uh, breaking it down into three if the developer is interested in doing something like that. And uh, we can go over that in our meetings, but that's one of the concerns I do have. Okay, thank you. Um, next. But I would have a concern as well, depending upon the types of units that are going to be developed, if the number is going to be increased. Um, uh, John, would you mind talking to me for that? Thank you. Okay. Depending upon the number of, of units that are proposed and um, going to be increased once we hear from the developer, I would be concerned about the size of the units, the land space for each unit, how the units are going to be placed with regard to wetlands as well, and also how that affects other, which technically on, on one level, you know, may not be something we have to think about, but I'm sure the residents who are all here would think about what's it going to do in terms of usage for other town services, whether it's water, sewage, whatever it would be, because the more units you have and the more people you're putting in there, logic tells us all that that's going to put more stress on, on everything throughout the town. So having said that, I'd, I'd like to hear that information from the developer, but I'd really be interested in hearing what the developer has to say with regard to the number of affordable units, the types of affordable units as well that are going to be there so that they're still keeping the structure of the 40B concept. 
Anyone else on the board? Any questions or comments I'm regarding? Agree with Greg. We've uh, never had success with townhouses or, uh, or duplexes. As a matter of fact, the, uh, not only we have not had success, we've had actually court arguments over them. Uh, one of them being on William Street, where uh, a chain link fence went down the middle and became an ISO. Um, so I would feel the same way that, that from what Greg expressed, that um, we can include townhouse looking styles but they'd have to stay as one owner. And, and before we even go too far, whether or not, uh, based on the, the suggestion of um, Mallory Ernstein, whether or not the attorney for the town has had an opportunity to look into this yet and whether we have an answer. When I reviewed this um, memo from the town administrator, my initial comment was that it's hard for me to give an accurate answer because I haven't seen the proposed plan. So without really visually being able to see it, I'm only guessing at what it is she's describing. But in general, um, a 40B project is based on the land area that is involved in the application have different styles of homes that's able to happen within 140B development. Um, it's not limited to one particular style of homes. It's not even limited to one particular type of ownership of homes. You could have mixed ownership where you could have a portion of the project that's a rental, um, that's a rental version of the project and a portion of the project is home ownership. So um, I don't believe this is going to be a problem, but I can't comment 100% without seeing the proposed plan. Is there anything else before I turn it over to the developer? Okay. Fisher or uh, Chris, whenever you're ready. Good evening. My name is Fisher Hashem. Um, I'm the developer. Um, well, first of all, we didn't propose anything until we had a request from you, and we're happy to propose some ideas if that's your wish uh, on mixed uh, housing uh, development. This is not unusual, actually, as a matter of fact, there is um, uh, a similar situation in Lakeville that we're doing right now that is mixed. Uh, actually, it's, it's more mixed than what we might, what might happen here because they have for rent and for ownership development there. But we're not proposing anything for rent either, or we're not interested in proposing that either. Um, but what happens is, each different styles, like, like we have in Lakeville, there is different condo associations responsible for the maintenance of the townhouses or the cottage style. Um, and they, wherever there is common expense, uh, if there is such thing, uh, like such as uh, sewer treatment plant or sewer pump or something, they all contribute to that. But uh, they all are, each condo association is responsible for its uh, area. Uh, and uh, um, where there are single family homes, there will be homeowner association for, the, for that uh, space. So if, if it is your wish, we'll be happy. I just, I took it, I, you know, I heard uh, from the comments from Mallory, and I took it upon myself to brainstorm and come up with an idea and review it with her, but I didn't want to propose it until I have a right. request from you. Right. And now that I, we, if that's your wish, I'm happy to propose something and maybe we can bring it over to the work session and, 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 and we were hoping also to receive some comments from uh, the review engineers to see if we can also take that into account. The advantage of having uh, a mixed use on this is, is uh, you have slightly more open space uh, uh, it really gives character to, to the project, to the whole development, uh, and because it also addresses different needs, uh, there are definitely need a need for other than single family homes. There are young starting, uh, couples starting out that they might want, might not be able to afford a single family home, or uh, you know different. Dif there are different styles and different uh, demands from the market. As for the affordable part of it, the same percentages must apply 
you know, for like for single family homes, there needs to be 25% of that section for for a condo. I mean, townhouses, 25% of the townhouses need to be for affordable. A cottage is the same thing. So it, it just flows. Now, if there is, uh, with you know, it's it's also open for discussion. It's, it's the view of the board that there is more need for uh, affordables in certain section, we can discuss it and see what, what we, how we can work together. Okay, thank you. So, on this point of order, uh, Marguerite, is this something that we have to officially vote on for our new, uh, for our new proposal? How, how would we do this? Um, my recommendation is that you not take a vote at this time. I'm not sure that I completely agree with the developer's um, idea that the town needs to make a request um, for it to submit any changes. I personally believe that the board's responsibility is to review what is presented to it, um, provide comments. I think you've given some type of indication of various members' thoughts here, and that should be sufficient probably for Mr. Hashem to move forward, and I'm sure this could also be brought up a little bit preliminarily at the working session as well, um, in light of the fact that GZA did provide comments which I do understand you just received tonight. Okay, thank you. Yes, I agree. We, I didn't, I wasn't waiting for a formal request. I just okay. wanted a direction from you. Because it gets confusing if we have five different plans. And right. I just wanted direction from you that, okay, we would like you to just explore that possibility. That's all. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a formal request. Just to get a better sense, though, for the design team's benefit, um, the only negatives I heard were concerns about long-term viability, long-term maintenance, um, the ability to ensure that the townhomes are properly maintained. Fisher spoke to that, uh, but I just would reiterate that I think the, the uh, condo association management is a lot more sophisticated than it has been in years past in terms of how these things are managed, how they're funded, how they're leaned if there's an issue with maintenance. Um, so hopefully, if we neutralize that concern, as far as the overall proposal to be the provide more open space, provide varying building typology in terms of townhouses, condo, and single family, is that aspect appealing to everyone on the board? If you were to just say that there's no issue with maintenance, if that wasn't a concern, if we could get over that, would you be more interested in seeing varying typology based on the concerns of the town, or is the board's preference for single family homes? I mean, is there just a way to express so that we have a little better guidance to determine which direction to go? I think you know, my biggest concern would be, I like the idea of the a lesser footprint for all the houses and everything, and the town homes, but how, how much would we increase the number of units? And with, with that being said, more stress on the water supply, more stress on the fire department, things like that. So we are going from 92 to whatever number it turned out to be. It's great that we're decreasing the footprint of the buildings, but we're adding more units. That's my biggest concern with, with, the, mixed, with the mixed use, per se. Um, do we have any idea what the number would go to from, from the 92 at this point, or do we have any ideas, roughly? In the one buildings? That's my, that's my big concern, is stressing the town services. Right, and I think in preliminary discussions, uh, you know, with the water department, when you're changing building typology, you're changing the audience of buyers. You know, we mentioned empty nesters, young professionals uh, that haven't yet started a family. So, where, uh, you know, but again, ultimately, these types of things um, are for the board to consider. But where you're talking about a building typology that would attract a different type of buyer, the idea would be that it would use less water. We have one person showering versus a family shower. It would use less services where you have, you know, a, a, an aging uh, uh, couple that their children just fled the fled the nest type thing. Um, so that's something to take into account as far as your concerns about um, impact on town services. And I think my my sense was that that was kind of where the town administrator was kind of going with it as well. Uh, so just all things to consider and uh, you know, appreciate the feedback and this is all very helpful to us to decide which direction to go in because as everyone stated, we, we 
can't have multiple plans floating around. I think it's important to commit in one direction or another. Right, so I personally, I think before we discuss this further, I want to read in the other documents from the other town boards and then um, let the abutters speak on this behalf because we do have to give the developer a chance to address the abutters on this as well. So I think before we come to any kind of, we want this, we want that, I want to, uh, like I said, talk about what board, um, other town boards and the public has, has to say before we consider that. Is that sound yes. agree with everybody? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, the first, I would like to read into uh, the minutes, Strawberry Fields initial comments from um, Jeffrey Clune, who is the uh, superintendent of the Water District. This is dated um, July, uh, July 1st, 2009, that we received this. The district will require a tap at Strawberry, um, at Strawberry I, uh, in at the Somerset Ave entrance. It is possible if the preferred loop for this development should come from the Somerset Ave and Huffleberry cul-de-sac, otherwise Cranberry. It can be used as an alternative, but not preferred. We would like to have Country Hill Estates loop as well from the Strawberry cul-de-sac and Country Hill cul-de-sac. This is an area of concern for the, uh, for the district due to pressure and volume issues that already exist. We would like to propose an upgrade um, of the water mains to 12-inch duct uh, ductile iron pipe uh, from Dunkin' Donuts on Somerset Ave to Center Street. The water district will not allow any outside irrigation. Wells must be used for all <coughs> irrigation purposes. And that is the um, end, at the end of that memo from uh, the water district. The next, um, I have a document dated um, July 18th addressed to us, um, and this is coming from the uh, Board of Health and the uh, Dighton Stormwater Regulations. They say, we offer the following comments. One, the streams on the site are considered tributaries to a, water, uh, to a surface water supply, in front of they say zone A. This subdivision plan indicates stormwater discharges in the zone A or directed toward the streams. There is a strong likelihood of a significant impact occurring uh, to the zone A, taking into account the high density of houses in the development, poor soils, and shallow water table. Stormwater discharges are directed towards zone A, should be removed and set back from the receiving water and receive the highest and best practical method of treatment, and then they give the citation from the Mass Stormwater Handbook. Stormwater discharges to a zone, I believe that's a one, or zone A are prohibited. Number two, the water table on the site is fairly shallow. The USDA soils mapping for the area indicate water table depths of 24 to 72 inches below grade. Preliminary soils by the engineer indicate depth to water table of 36 to 66 below grade. There are only a few preliminary holes across the entire site. We are requesting more holes to be um, excavated prior to the design in the presence of the health agent or a third party across from the entire site for the homes, roadway, and drainage basins. Uh, drainage basins excuse me. Three, given the shallow water table on the site, there are several construction components which may pose, storm, pose stormwater problems, health problems, or create public hazards if not taken into consideration. And this is 3A. The sewer main may be very deep. This will pose problems for construction given the need for shoring and dewatering. 3B, the roadways need to be above the water table to avoid bleeding onto or through the pavement. Either of these conditions could lead to freezing, causing a public hazard. 3C, the drainage basins need to maintain required separations to the water table per the stormwater management handbook. 3D, Basement floors may be in the water table. This is extremely problematic as um, sump pumps are not a reliable solution and given the lot sizes, sump pump discharges would be too near to other homes. There should be no discharge of sump pumps or foundation drains onto the roadway or into any drainage system component um, for the public, uh, for protection of public health. And then next point four, it appears that there will be a connection from the drainage basin on drainage lot A 
to the existing drainage system on Route 138. This will require permission from the Mass Department of Transportation, the Mass Department of Transportation as will the curb cut for the roadway. And then this uh, summarizing, the Board of Health is recommending that the project design incorporates the following items. A. Soil borings be performed every 200 feet along the entire proposed roadway. B. A soil boring at the location of every proposed home. C. Every basement floor must be above the water table. D. The proposed roadway be a minimum of 18 inches above the designed water table. E. All soil testing should be performed in the presence of a third party or the Board of Health agent. And then F, given that Dayton is a right to farm community which allows animals on the property, small lots with chickens, ro uh, roosters, goats, and other animals pose noise and vermin uh, problems. Larger lots and more space between homes to reduce potential conflicts would be preferable. The groundwater is a serious issue and we need to protect the residents of the new homes as well as the town wetlands and water supply. It is imperative for the entire project concept from houses to driveways to streets to drainage systems incorporate best manager practices in order to protect the public health. Thank you, and it's side uh, Todd M. Pilling, and he's from he's the uh, Board of Health uh, Board of Health Agent, excuse me, that we have for the town. And then, excuse me, there's um, the one from uh, Jeffrey Clune, and it looks like he sent another one. Um, and this is received August 1st. So um, I'll just uh, read this one. The district will require a tap at Strawberry at Somerset Ave. If it is possible, the preferred loop for this development should come from the Somerset Ave and Huckleberry cul-de-sac, otherwise Cranberry. It can be, it's the same, yeah, but it wasn't changing something. Yeah. Um, can be used as an alternative but not preferred. We would like to have Country Hill Estates looped as well from the Strawberry cul-de-sac and uh, Country Hill cul-de-sac. We realize the obstacles that this represents in finding a suitable partner that would allow for an easement. This is an area of concern for the district due to pressure and volume issues that already exist. We would also like to propose an upgrade of the water, uh, water mains to 12 inches ductile um, iron pipe from Dunkin' Donuts on Somerset Ave to Center Street. An alternative to this would be providing land, uh, would be providing land to build a two million gallon storage tank. A fire flow test must be performed not before September. The, water, the Dighton Water District will not allow any outside irrigation. Wells must be for all irrigation purposes. And um, before I read um, the GZA findings, um, do you guys want to um, address those concerns, or would you like me to read the last um, um, input that we have? Sorry. Whose findings? The Board of Health findings? Um, well, yeah, from, from what I read so far, the, uh, the Board of Health, and Water, and the Sewer. So everything um, that I heard water mentioned feeding. from the Board of Health uh, referenced uh, state stormwater management regulations and principles that we adhere to in development in terms of making sure our foundations are properly constructed and taking into account the water table. Uh, I know Bishop's team has, has, has constructed projects in some very difficult sites, so this site is not nearly as difficult as some of the other ones as far as the water table is concerned. So that's not a concern from our perspective, but to the extent all of the other uh, regulations that were cited um, are of concern to this board or the Board of Health, we have to comply with them anyway. We, we can't get waivers from those. Those are state regulations. Um, the concern about uh, Dighton being a right to farm town, um, this is a 40B project. It, it, it will be subject to a homeowners association, and it would be our plan that the homeowners association would have reasonable restrictions on, obviously, the type of animals that could be uh, you know, owned by homeowners in, in the development. As with you know, if you lived in a condo, you're not going to have a rooster uh, in the hallway in the morning. It's the same idea. Um, so nothing that I heard in, in those proposals is of any concern. We did meet, at, at this board's suggestion, um, the design team did meet with the Dighton Water District and with the uh, sewer department, uh, which, you know, as I, as I said at the outset of the last hearing, is, is not something we would ordinarily do in a 40B project. We would be before this board. We would just wait to hear the comments, but because 
um, these issues are such a serious concern. We, we went before those boards and we heard that feedback and we're, we're going to continue to explore options to try to uh, determine whether or not um, there are things we can do to help mitigate some of the impacts they're describing. Um, the one that I heard twice uh, as far as a looped water main to Country Hill, you know, if someone's willing to grant us an easement, uh, then we would, we would uh, be willing to install a looped water main, but my uh, feeling is that no one would be willing to grant us an easement. So our project does not uh, impact water quality and, and water pressure in the area to the point where uh, it would support the denial of a 40 b development. However, if there are concerns about it from a convenience perspective or from a comfort perspective, then certainly we'll, we'll, we'll help if someone were to grant us an easement, but that's not something that uh, could be a condition of the permit. Um, but we have also spoken to those departments about how to study, um, you know, potential ways to help Dighton, in a broader sense, study their water availability and, and sewer availability uh, with an eye towards 5, 10, 20 years down the road. Um, and not just as it relates to this project. Uh, because as we heard at the last hearing, uh, as we sit here tonight and when this project will be built, there is adequate supply, adequate capacity, adequate pressure, the quality will and has to be maintained, but many of the concerns were with a long-term planning concern. Long-term, yes, there are concerns, so how can we help with the long-term planning? And that's some of the things that we're going to continue to discuss uh, to see whether or not there's an appropriate condition for this permit uh, that would be the type of condition that would mitigate some of those concerns. All right, thank you. And then the other um, piece that we have um, from the town is from Peter Williams, who's the engineer for uh, GZA. And this is dated uh, July 31st. Dear board members, this letter presents the result of GZA's review of the comprehensive permit application and definitive subdivision plans submitted for Strawberry Fields Estates residential subdivision. The application and plans were reviewed with respect to the, to the applicable sections of Dighton, uh, Dighton Zoning Bylaw, Town of Dighton uh, Planning Board Rules and Regulations, and General Engineering Practices. Materials reviewed by the GZA uh, included the following. Plans titled Comprehensive Permit 40B Subdivision, Strawberry Field Estates, um, 7, uh, 766 Somerset Ave, Dighton, Massachusetts, uh, 02715, dated May 30th, 2019, prepared by Jacob Bristol Engineering of Northeastern Massachusetts, prepared by uh, prepared for Strawberry Fields Estates LLC of Southeastern Massachusetts. And the Comprehensive Permit Application, Strawberry Fields, Dighton, Mass., dated May 30th, 2019, prepared by Delphic Associates LLC of New Bedford, Massachusetts. The following presents GZA's review, uh, review comments. One, the project narrative indicates that the Southwest 66.2 uh, acre parcel will not be developed and indicates that there, indicates that it is anticipated that the parcel will be designed as open space. Information on how the designation uh, will occur should be submitted. Two, zone A and C to a surface water supply. Three, color version of NHESP map um, in provided tab 11 of the application binder should be provided. Four, stormwater management drainage calculations should be submitted. Five, proposed grading of lots 83 and 84 could divert additional runoff to the abutting lot at 800 Somerset Avenue. Six, Detailed stormwater calculations should be submitted to confirm that the proposed infiltration basin number 3C will not impact 800 Somerset Ave. 7. The proposed outlet for infiltration basin 3A is a direct connection to the catch basin of the west side of Somerset Avenue. Direct connections to catch basins should be avoided and, is not, and it is not likely that the Massachusetts Highway Department will approve this type of connection. The drain outlet from infiltration basin 3A should connect directly to the drain, man, uh, drain man, uh, manhole excuse me, on, uh, in Somerset Avenue. Eight, it appears that the sheet runoff from Cranberry Lane will increase runoff volume, volumes to Somerset Avenue, which may not be acceptable to the Mass Highway Department. Nine, a profile 
for the detention basin on the north side of Cranberry Lane should be shown on, on the plans. The profile should indicate um, calculated peak water levels during, the severe, during severe storm events. The outlet for this detention basin discharges directly to the wetland without erosion protection. 10. Emergency outlets should be provided for all infiltration, infiltration basins. 11. The existing grade at the down gradient discharge point of all infiltration and detention basins should be shown on the plans. 12. Landscaping and lighting plans, like sheet 23, should be provided for the entire project. 13. The project may be subject to an earth removal permit. 14. The applicant should, conf uh, should confirm the capacity of the existing sewer system to handle additional sewer flows. 15. Sidewalk ramps should be provided for the sidewalks and locations should be indicated on the plans. 16. Hydraulic calculations for the site, site improvements should be submitted and as stipulated in the Wetlands Protection Act regulations and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Stormwater Management Standards. 17. Limits of Zone A zone, uh, and Zone C surface water protection and outstanding water, uh, outstanding resource water areas within the site should be shown on the plan. Information to, conf uh, to confirm compliance of the proposed project with state regulations um, 310 uh, CMR 22 and 314 CMR 4 protecting these areas should be submitted. 18. Test pit data locations for all test pits should be shown on the plans. 18. The drainage calculation should provide a design point at 784 Somerset Avenue. 20. The drainage calculation should confirm the capacity of the down gradient drain pipe system to its outlet point on the east side of Somerset Avenue. 21. Catch basin inlet capacity calculation should be provided. 22. Groundwater um, mounting calculations may be required. 23. A minimum of 44% TSS removal should be removed prior to the infiltration of stormwater runoff. 24. The proposed water system must comply with the requirements of the White and uh, White Dighton Water District. 25. The proposed sanitary sewer system must comply with the requirements of the Dighton Sewer Department. And last, 26 should be provided for the proposed sewer pump station. Should any of the board members have any questions on the information presented in this letter, please feel free to contact me and then it gives his number and then his uh, email address for GPA and that is signed Peter Williams, the Senior Project Manager. Um, I know we were just... No, I don't think we have anything formal from the sewer department, no. Tom Ferry's here. Do you want to speak on that? I didn't see you speaking. Sorry, Tom. Okay. Uh, Tom Ferry, uh, thank you for the service. Uh, we, we did meet in this division in uh, one of these engineers, Mr. Disco. Uh, very good meeting, by the way. Thanks for coming. And we have a lot of experience. Would you mind just lowering the microphone? Thank you. Okay, we couldn't hear you. We couldn't hear you. <laughs> I'm short too, I'm sorry, I get it. We, we both share some concerns and uh, we had a good interaction with them. Uh, our meet last meeting was July 22nd. We haven't met again to uh, approve the minutes that we had. Uh, so I brought tonight just some bullets to share. Uh, so like I said, we met with Christian and his engineer, Mr. Gregory Driscoll, uh, about the project of Strawberry Fields. They, they had stated an increase from 92 to 94, three bedroom homes. Uh, we're working on that. We proposed the two entrances on uh, Mass Duke East Highway. The next meeting with the CBA is tonight. Mr. Hesham stated that they do not have a sewer design yet. Um, I don't think we still got that yet, right? right. Mr. Hesham also stated that based on the, the Title V numbers, it'll be about 30,000 gallons per day. Um, that was based on um, the Dyke Woods project. I, I'm not going to read every bullet here. Some of them are redundant. Um, it was also 
also discussed about flows and number of houses on gra gravity versus pump station. Uh, we actually had some great discussions on that, uh, which will um, determine the outcome of the longevity of the project and our town system. Harold also, uh, our superintendent Harold stated that they would really need to look and figure out if they are planning on using the gravity as a would impact the, the current pump station, as uh, Mr. Williams also alluded to earlier. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Bishop is, we consider, uh, they are considering that the system will remain privately maintained, however, we're going to be receiving the flow, and we'll have to process that in the future. Uh, Harold stated that it would be tied into the municipal sewers and the best interest of the town will need to be considered. Fisher agreed. And Fisher also, that, that, I don't mean Fisher also already stated that he met with the water department already. And, um, we, we agree with most of the comments that were made in that discussion. We review the plans, discuss regarding the elevations, the southerly entrance of the southern two roads, where some concerns where some changes may need to be made because the elevation to the highway versus pumping, you know, gravity versus pumping. Uh, our board is currently possibly considering changing engineers in our park, which may have a slight delay in communicating with him, um, but he's waiting for that new name and uh, looking forward to signing a new relationship if needed. Uh, we're not clear on that yet. Uh, next meeting is not until uh, the last week in August. Harold has pretended state of the mission that the pump station needs to be upgraded. That's the one that's by Dunkin' Donuts that receives everything on 138, including the desalination plant and the power plant, which are pretty big customers already. So, uh, and that's the station that's giving us a little trouble right now also. We, uh, we, we were questioning if our capacity at that station that I just mentioned. We don't know our capacity or the flow rates at this time and the impacts this will have on either. So uh, we need their engineer to help figure out the actual plan coming forward and for us to consider and also look at whatever data we can provide for them to come to that. Fisher was also, has his sewer rules and regulations, he yeah, has them. And also, also he, he looks, Fisher uh, realized that uh, once we have our new engineer, he needs to know the cost affiliated with that communication that's going to happen. And he, uh, he has the plans that he needed to from us that night. And that's what all we have at this time. Thank you. Hopefully we can continue our relationship. Thank you. Um, before, we, before we open up to the uh, developer, um, Mr. Ferry, can we just have a copy of um, your um, your bullet points when you have a chance? I mean, not tonight, obviously, but whenever you have a chance. Okay. Any questions or comments right now from the board regarding what we've heard? Before I open up to the developer. Yeah, yeah, right. You have anything like this? Like, go ahead. Great. So, um, to continue to present just some of the vital statistics and, and basic design elements of the project. Uh, we have the project's traffic engineer here tonight, Bill Scully, uh, who's going to give a preliminary overview of uh, the findings of our traffic report, which has been submitted to the town's peer review expert for traffic. So the idea would be just to give a general presentation this evening of the conclusions, then obviously uh, the technical memorandum would be subject to peer review, and then the board's engineer uh, peer review uh, for traffic and the traffic peer review engineer would come before this board and uh, critique the applicant's uh, report at a future hearing, and then we could discuss concerns about traffic further. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill Scully. Thank you.
There's one in the back there. Good evening, uh, my name is Bill Scully. Uh, I am from Green International. Turn the board this way. For the record, my name is Bill Scully. I'm with Green International Affiliates. We have the traffic engineering consultant uh, on the project. Um, as part of the process, it's typical, and in this process, it, it went through to request traffic uh, impact and access study uh, on the project. Um, and I, I know it sounds like there's discussions going on in terms of uh, unit type and all that, uh, but what we studied were 92 units of single family homes. Um, and you probably all received a copy of the traffic report. Right. So that was dated April 2019. And as was just stated, it has not gone un undergone uh, peer review at this point. We're just waiting for that. And, work with a peer review consultant. So, I, I don't know how much detail to really go through. I know you said general, and overview, and all that. But uh, let me, uh, I'll go through a few things. Uh, and then happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so when we do a traffic impact study, the purpose of that is, and there's a couple different purposes, but one certainly is to understand the roadway and the budding network that the project's going to come out to, to access uh, for the project. In this case, it's Somerset Ave, Route 138, under Mass DOT jurisdiction. Um, we also, uh, for most of the concerns on traffic impact studies and new development, is how much traffic is going to come out of this new development and add it to the network. So that's another major purpose of conducting a traffic impact study. And then to assess the site access, the ability of those who ultimately occupy the site, their ability to enter and exit the, uh, the site. And we make uh, projections as to where they're going to go, they turn left, turn right, uh, travel to the north, east, south, and west. And, and all of that is documented in the traffic report. And, and uh, we follow generally accepted practices and guidelines that MassDOT follows, uh, national transportation organizations develop. So we go through and, and we follow, again, generally accepted procedures, the steps in conducting a traffic study, um, and, uh, and that includes assumptions and, and design criteria. Um, we've got, we go through and collect data, so we collected traffic volumes on Somerset near the site. We uh, collected some peak out with a residential development, you'll study the morning and the afternoon peak period, uh, which is typical to be the peak on the abutting roadway system, mostly related to commuting, the commuting time period, school related time period. So that's when you'll see your peak, and that's what we tend to try to evaluate the impact. Traffic goes down during the middle of the day. If, if you're having no problem in the peak time, Presumably, you'll have no problem in the middle of the day. Um, we research crash information. We collect speed data. We go out to the proposed site drives. This map is in the report. It's just an uh, aerial map. It shows an outline of the site and where the approximate two points of access would be. We'll measure site distances uh, for vehicles approaching this driveway, which is most critical, and then also vehicles leaving the site drive, and make an estimate on that. Um, and uh, 
and then we'll forecast traffic. Now when we, when we do our analysis, we're studying, we're comparing conditions without the project and with the project. We'll, while we collect existing information and we do analysis on existing, we'll also be projecting out, in this case, seven years forward, and we'll have a seven year forward time period, so 2026, without the project, in a 2026 condition with the project. And then we compare what, what a traffic volume's like, what is operation like, how, what changes exist. And, and again, that's another thing that comes out of the impact study is the, the incremental change. Um, so, uh, let's see, how much detail? Um, I, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude. And, and again, I've got the numbers in the report uh, to go over. But essentially, while well, we have 92 new houses, presumably all occupied. So yes, it's going to add some traffic to the, to the roadway system. Um, single family houses, generally a development would uh, generate between about three quarters to a trip, a one trip per unit in the peak hour. So at 92 homes, you're going to generate somewhere between 80 and 90 vehicle trips during that peak hour. The peak hour is the 60 minute time period. <clears throat> Most of the traffic in the morning is leaving the site. Most of the traffic in the afternoon is coming back to the site. Uh, that's important in terms of uh, are they turning into the site or crossing traffic and turning left or right. We've projected about 30% going to the north about 30 to 40 percent going to the south, uh, south of center, and I think, uh, 50, if I remember correctly, 15 percent east along center, 15 percent to the west. We project traffic in the direction based on a few different things. We look at the current patterns out there, so we know how the existing traffic in the town, whether it's town traffic or through traffic from other towns, but we know the pattern out there. So in the morning, for an example, on Somerset Ave, 60% of the peak hour traffic is headed north. And in the afternoon, about 60% is heading south. Um, we also look at census data. And that census data starts to give us an, an indication of residents of the town, where do they work. And, and if we know where they work, yes, we're making assumptions, but we can generally identify the, the path they'll take, the streets that they'll take. So we use that information to develop that estimated pattern. Um, our findings show traffic can enter and exit the sites either drive, and we've made assumptions on each drive, and that was based on the development layout and the direction of flow that they'll go in. Um, they'll be able to enter and exit uh, with short delays. Um, Site distances at the driveway exceed, meet or exceed the criteria for both 45 miles an hour and 50 miles an hour on Somerset Ave. Posted speeds on Somerset are 40 and 45, 45 more to the north, 40 as you get down towards Town Hall and the Center Street intersection. Average speed where we measured was up around here uh, at the site. Average was about 45 miles an hour and the high speed was about 50 miles an hour. So we did our site distance. Site distance analysis on, on both, both uh, criteria. Um, and let's see, what else? Uh, our recommendations really deal with the site drives. The site drives being stop sign control, make sure, you know, usually when you construct the new site drives, um, you're going to do some clearing on the edges. Um, and those should be maintained. Uh, signage, landscaping, whatever types of things you do to make the entry nice, you still set back or you set low so that if you've got great site distance now, you don't want to ruin it in the future. Um, so those are really where our recommendations are. Um, and, I, and I think uh, it might have been mentioned earlier, this is a DOT road, so some permitting with DOTs uh, going to have to occur anyways, and then they'll review all this information uh, as well. So I, I don't anticipate them coming up with anything uh, additional, but you never know.
And I'll end there and answer any questions. I'll turn it back to you. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions, please. If you could, I'll give them to you one at a time and ask you to answer them one at a time. Mm -hmm. The first question is, you mentioned during peak periods roughly 88 vehicles, 88 vehicles. How are you arriving at that? And what I mean by that is, what are you projecting as the number of vehicles in the development? What are you projecting as the number of adults driving those vehicles? Because that breaks out to less than one per household during peak period. Where are you getting those yeah. numbers? All right, so, all right, let me go through that. Um, open up the right one. So when we forecast traffic, when we uh, forecast traffic, this, this, as I said, several steps. So the first one is how much traffic are we going to generate? <clears throat> so we use models that have been developed and published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, and those models are based on hundreds of observations of similar land uses. So we have a suburban type environment, single family homes. And they've studied, and it's been transportation engineers all over the country. And that data gets reviewed, compiled, analyzed, and models are developed. And for about the last well, I've been doing this a little over 40 years, probably about that same amount of time. In general, those rates that I mentioned earlier tonight have held pretty solid all through this time. And we've updated, we've collected more data over time, dropped out old data, looked at new data, and you still end up with somewhere in that three quarters to one trip per unit. So, um, so this table right here, which was in the report, so in the morning peak hour, 92 homes is projected as, as we run, so we run those models with 92 units of housing. We're, we don't, we're not looking at how many cars are actually sitting in the neighborhood, how many adults are in the neighborhood. We don't get, we don't need that kind of information. All of our empirical data and the research is based on actual counts of a development, cars going in, cars coming out, how many houses were in that development that produced that pattern, and we develop a rate. And that, that gets just compiled, as I mentioned, hundreds of research data points, and we end up with, with a model that then helps us forecast the morning and the afternoon and the daily numbers of trips. Um, uh, so in, in the afternoon, we're projecting 94 vehicle trips for those 92 homes, with again, most of them, 59 of them, entering the site. Um, so now a, a common question, that, or comment that comes up all the time is, well, you got 90 units, and you know, most of those units probably have two cars, maybe even three cars. Well, all the data that we've observed over the years, you know, myself or other, engineers, same characteristics. And what happens is we're looking at a peak 60 minutes, and not every one of those cars goes out at the same time, or in the same hour. And what we, and that's, that's we've measured that. This, the federal government has measured that. So we know um, in the peak hour in the morning, maybe 30, 33% of people go to work. And in the hour preceding that peak hour, maybe that number is 28 to 29%. And then hour after that peak hour, it might be 25 to 27%. You know, and if you have a spread between five, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., up to 9 a.m., 10 a.m., where all the commuters, let's say, eventually go to work. So, so anyway, so that, that you know, that, that comment that says, well, you have multiple cars in there, why aren't, 270 coming out of there at the same time. Well, it just doesn't happen. And, and, and we know it doesn't happen because we've got hundreds of observations that tell us that, and data that tells us that. Um, so anyway, so, so we, we do use national model. The national model is based on actual data, 
collected at similar land uses. Um, and uh, does that answer that first question? Well, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so maybe keeping with that with that part of the question. My my one of my concerns would be where your where your numbers are coming from in terms of, for example, if, if I if the same development were being built in Newton or Watertown, mm -hmm. and a lot of folks were taking the commuter rail or the green line, mm -hmm. then the numbers might be down. Mm -hmm. So what's the comparison that you use? Okay, so again, I mean, uh, you referred to hundreds of variables. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't list them all, but I, there I are hundreds I, of data points. I, um, from my perspective, that would be important for us to hear, probably for everyone here, to hear where you're, what you're using for justification yeah. for this particular project. So I'll leave that one at that, and I'll move on. We can get to that other, in another conversation. So you want me to answer the Newton thing or not? Um, you can answer that now, or we can... No, let me, uh, well, let me try and okay. see if that answers that question. All right, so... How, so, uh, um, the national database, the ITE database, right now is largely, if not 99.9%, .9 built on suburban locations that have little or no transit. And it might have some transit, but you know, it's not just a substantial amount of users. So, so DITE is perfect example of what that data is based on. If we ever got into the Newtons and the Quincy's and the, uh, you know, Somerville's or, and even, you know, a little further out, we then, again, remember that census data I talked about, from that we also get information that says, oh, 10% uh, of the residents use transit to go to work. So we may make some manual adjustments to the rate to account for that, uh, you know, transit use. In this case, we don't. We're not making any reduction. Uh, and, and again, we even look at things like, well, you take transit, but you have to get driven to the transit station. We're not going to make any reduction in, in uh, the number. So hopefully that answers that question. So my, my, my other question for now is, when you do the traffic study, from the, the two entrances or exits, whatever you want to call it, from the development, I don't know how far north and south exactly the stoplights are. I'm assuming you've looked at that. Yes, no? Uh, yes. My question is going to be, if you have, my question is going to be, because this is another thing that makes a big difference to people who are traveling through 138 or the adjacent areas, is what's the amount of time difference? For example, right now, if you're at that corner stoplight up the street here, you can generally get through in one cycle, sometimes two cycles. In order for that to be the same, with the amount of, if we do the new traffic flow, what has to change? Do we have to change the amount of time that the light is red or green, or are we now looking to potentially be back up at four cycles going north and south? Or do we potentially have to look at another traffic solution down the road for that intersection as a result of this? Um, right. uh, and then the same thing going north. I don't know if I can answer that fully right here tonight, but uh, <clears throat> the impact, this project is certainly going to add some traffic down into that section. Um, it's going to add in the morning about 35 vehicles over the peak hour into that intersection going southbound and about 20 something uh, in the afternoon. Uh, our analysis has shown there is a slight increase in vehicle delay on that approach. Um, our analysis has also shown very minimal change in overall intersection uh, average delay and in operating conditions. Now that doesn't mean that Traffic signal timing changes can't be looked at to see, okay, can you can you eliminate, if we're increasing uh, delay by three seconds on average at the intersection, can signal timing changes eliminate that? Possibly. Uh, I, I'd have to look at that to be able to tell you that uh, exactly. 
and to also know that can you do it? What's it, what's it going to do? If you if you change certain things, then other things are impacted. So, so bottom line is right now is the analysis has shown very little change due to the project at that intersection in terms of what a particular driver would really feel and perceive. Virtually, the driver is going to perceive almost nothing different than without the project in the future. It's, it's that close. However, you can, uh, it looks like an old, an old installation. Um, anyways, I don't know if the state has that on its list. Um, but signal timing can always be looked at. That's all I have for right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so before we turn over the butters, I just want to ask anybody else on the board with any more questions? Was there um, any recommendation for force walk or sidewalk or flashing yellow caution lights? Along Somerset Avenue? We didn't, Somerset Avenue. No, we did not make that recommendation. Um, how many children were there expecting in this? Different project. How many were? Children. Uh, uh, what did you guys figure for residents and children for this mission? I don't have those numbers. You what did you figure for you residents and children in this project? The average in other subdivisions, we have, we have that survey from our own subdivisions. The average is uh, point three per household, or three children. Less than one child per house. With the playground being across the street, Sorry. with the playground being across the street at the town hall, uh, had any thought been given to a crosswalk from there? No, we haven't thought about it. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Michelle, do you have anything? No. Jason, go ahead. I have a question with the... Come, you make a right out of Country Hill Drive, and there's a, there's a hill that, that goes up. And can you explain to me how you take that into account with your sight lines? There's been several accidents there over the years, and, and I know it's a, a hot button topic for certain residents of this town. Kind of explain that to us a little bit more. How you take that into the site plan that we're doing? Well, <clears throat> we did not do site distance measurements at Country Club Drive, but we did them relative to the two proposed site drives. So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go back and look at that and get back to you on that, but. But I'll tell you that our approach site distance to the proposed drives was 425 feet or more um, in all directions. And that meets or and exceeds the uh, standard criteria of 45 and 50 miles an hour. So I don't know. I, I'd have to look at that specific country club drive. And I, I, can, I can do that and let you know. It does not appear to have an effect on our site drives. So they may have an issue there, I don't know. Um, I just have one question too. Um, obviously there are two entrance slash exits in and out of the development. Um, where would, would you, are you guys proposing one bus stop at each or just one? That's gonna be a huge thing and we're having kids walk to one bus stop. Is the bus stop gonna stop at two? I believe just one bus stop is being proposed. I also have some concerns with the hill coming over there, Country Hill. I've lived in this town for 50 years. There's been three fatalities right there alone. Um, coming down over the top, have you, have you calculated anything for like a school bus now that we're talking about picking up one three child for a house um, at 92? So I'm just going with some mathematics here. Uh, that bus is going to be sitting there for a while. I'm just saying we've got a 450 feet of clearance before you see the red lights on the bus. Is that the estate? Okay, so what I would say is 
We've I'm got just concerned it. about the bus going to be stopping the on bus the 38. The bus is going to be higher than what okay. we And we've also had fatalities on in front of that development coming up the other side as well as down the other We're side. We're still talking about Country Club Drive. Right above, if you pull out of Country Hill Estate. Again, right. I'd, have to, I'd be happy to look at that location. I know of two fatalities right there. I also know of another fatality at the proposed second driveway coming away from Country Hill Estates, another fatality right there. Um, for the sight visions of people coming over the hill too fast, I'll just use other speeds. Nobody, I'm going to say I've seen people do separately. Uh, I'm not saying it's the right calculations, but when you've done your calculations, have you done anything with the school buses in consideration? Now, much traffic is going to be sitting down the school bus coming down 138 at 745, 8 o'clock in the morning. It does that now, correct? But there's no school buses right now. No school buses at all on 130. Right now, there's, there's some. They don't stop. Yeah. They don't want there's no, When you did your study, there was Oh, we no did ask. We did all our, well, first of all, site distance measurements, we do, and, and you can do that at any time. We did, and we look at speed that was hurting. Um, if you saw, we probably had tubes out on the road for several days, and we look at the actual speeds that are being run over there without us there, you know, it's going 48 to 72 hours of data. We go out any time and it's a visual. You know, you're looking at, can I see a two foot object at the edge of the, edge of the drive in the intersecting road and where do I see that two foot high object? Now a school bus is what? Uh, six, seven, eight feet what high. I'm say is you're in a culvert with yes. two exits. Entrances are going to be there in a culvert actually. It's set down in the bottom of the land, dips down. So now you're coming over the hill or you're coming down the other hill. Is this traffic stop for a school bus? Has anybody considered anything for that? We have still blind corners coming into the section. So I, I know that the variables that he has in his report include what he used for assumptions that will then be presented to the peer review engineer, but that's exactly the type of concern that should be directed to the peer review engineer to say, hey guys, we have this real world situation that we are envisioning. Can you take a look at that to make sure that the standard numbers that Mr. Scully used reflect that real world situation? So that's exactly the type of observation, you know, uh, experience that there, there were fatalities at the location, we should see whether or not that, that type of information was incorporated into the report, things like bus stops. So the more feedback we can get like that, I think it should be conveyed to the peer review expert, and then the peer review expert could say, hey, wait a second, there's a problem here. Bill will go back and look at it with the peer review expert. But I think the thing is, all the analysis that he did was standard analysis. Two-foot object, all right, standard assumptions. Can you see a two-foot object given the observed speeds at the 80th percentile of the observed speeds, and then if it is check the box, you move on yeah. until the peer review expert comes along and says, "Is it that we can get the bus to go on to your property?" I don't know. If that's down the road. How we so what that. usually happens is the bus company, and does Dighton have a, a municipally owned bus company, or is it a private service? Right. So the private service determines where they feel as though the stop is safe and appropriate based on a survey of all the number of children. So they might not be a bus stop there initially as the, as the houses get built, the more they determine. Okay. All right, so at the time, I'm going to um, open it up to the abutters. Um, is there, I recall one last time, is there any more questions or comments among the board? Um, I don't see plans. This it has to do with traffic, and I'll explain it in a second, but a, a house for the children to stand in when there is inclement weather for the bus stop, correct? You have no plans for that, like we've done with the other 40 Bs? And when we did the previous 40 B for that area, I know it wasn't you, uh, I don't know if, if you guys remember, didn't we have the bus coming in and turning around at a cul-de-sac? So that it wasn't stopping on Route 138? Right. It, can't something like that, this be proposed so we, we eliminate a bus stop on, on 138? Do you know what I mean, Bishop? No, I, I, that actually makes sense. I mean, trying to determine whether or not there's an appropriate turnaround, but we do right. have right. 
two entrances, that, that's, yeah. fees, that's potentially feasible. But I think ultimately the bus company makes that determination. If the board were to look at this plan after hearing from its traffic peer review engineer that there may be an appropriate place on site, if you floated that as a condition, yeah. then we could take it back and analyze it and say, hey, yeah, that could work as a condition. Let's so that's that what happens. In the, in the, the bus is going to go into the project and, and, and turn around. Are you opposed to building a housing unit for the, uh, the, the children? No, a bus stop, it's, it's something very common. And it's just, you know, as the plans develop, that type of detail is, is added. And it's definitely something. Right. Okay, so before I open up to the public, um, just so you guys know, if you could please state your name um, and sign in on the sheet and put your address. This is all just for the public record. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, one more point of order. I don't believe we actually set a date and time for the site visit. So we discussed logistics. Not yet. Do you want to do that at the end of the meeting? Yes. Right. Okay, yep. Um, to just, uh, sign in uh, your name and your address, please state for the record. John. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just so that so that everyone's aware when we're talking about the buses and coming in and out, there are two other developments in this town that this developer has already completed, or one is almost complete. The other one is completed. And when we discuss buses, while the developments were under construction, all of the buses for all grades stayed on Pine Street only. They couldn't go in the developments because the developments were under construction. And keep in mind that development for construction for buses to go in and out could be several years. Having said that, now that the developments are both, one's completed and the other one is mostly completed, the elementary school buses do come into the development and actually stop in front of every individual home at both developments. The okay. middle school and the high school buses still stay in Pine Street for those little, you know, the, bu the bus houses at the end of the development. But the elementary schools, do come in and make the entire loop. I don't know if that's determined uh, with the bus company privately or between the school department and the bus company, but there is door-to-door -door service for the younger kids. Okay, thank you. So just so everyone is aware, it's about um, 8.25, around nine o'clock um, approximately, um, if the abutters have all felt like they've spoken, is when we will start to talk about the, our new, con our new uh, concerns for the potential new proposal, so to speak. Um, just so I just don't want to feel anyone in the public has been cut off, but we do have to allow time for us to consider what they have said to apply to um, our uh, uh, finding for them. So if there's anyone like to come up, uh, just one at a time. Again, your name, uh, you, don't have, you don't have to state your address, um, but if you just want to at least uh, please sign in with name and address and then state your name into the microphone just for the record. Thank you. My name is Samantha Turgeon. Um, I'm wondering if the school committee or the school department has been consulted excuse me, on this project at all, and if not, why? Now, I know um, uh, Marguerite, just correct me if I'm wrong, for 40B, uh, the state says that it is up to the schools to comply um, with the town's needs, not something so much that the developer is something that they present to the school committee. The school committee is the one that um, tells the town the infrastructure and how that should be adapted to the uh, development. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing everything that's being said with the fan, so... Um, she just wanted to know about the school committee and the school department. Yeah, I can hear this way. Um, and just and how they and how if they've addressed it and how they go about addressing it in the future. So, this, typically the zoning board of appeals will be sending um, information to all the town boards and commissions, including the school department, to provide any comments. I'll make sure that if it hasn't done so, that it does include the school department, um, because that's usually done. Um, we, the town can't uh, can't deny a 40B development because of um, increased. Um, impact to the school system. They have an obligation to um, assimilate whatever increased um, impact to the school system in terms of numbers of students, but there certainly is information the school department can provide some good guidance on, particularly things like bus stops, safety, thinking about planning and phasing for purposes of um, safety, safety of students and residents, and especially now that they've been working with some ongoing development over a number of years. So um, if if uh, they haven't provided those comments, it might also be due to the fact that at least initially, as this has gone, uh, gotten started, we've been in some recession, and I know school committees are tending to meet 
more regularly as soon as school comes back into session. So I anticipate those comments will still be coming in, and obviously this public hearing is still open to receiving all of those comments. So has there been a notice sent to them to provide comments? I don't believe to. I am not. In a, in a, well, no, in, in our bylaw, there is no. We need to get the whole process together before we submit to the school committee. We don't know what we're actually building yet. Okay, so it will be. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and then I heard some comments about, you know, targeting empty nesters and older people. I mean, are these one bedroom, two bedroom apartments? I heard this in regards to like the water situation. <laughs> At this moment in time, you have been here in the state about doing some design reforms. We were asking about complexes, uh, single family homes, uh, multi family homes, things like that. He's going to bring a few designs in at that point. At that point, so we can help him to the city, go over all these things. Until he brings the design, we couldn't understand how many people are going to be living in, uh, in the four bedroom, three bedroom, two bedroom, until we see the designs. So again, this is just an open preliminary hearing, hearing everybody's input, questions, concerns. Right now, we we'll have all these answers after a few more weeks. Okay, um, and then in regard to the site, um, what do you call the site line? The site line for the bus for the on the right. Okay. So I live at 784 Somerset Ave. So I, I, my kids get on the bus. The bus stops on the opposite side of the road, and I've had grievances about it because there is a blind spot, and I can't see anybody coming up that hill. Um, there is a hill there, and I would guarantee that there's not enough, like there's not 450 feet. Um, I'm positive there's not. So I have experienced that, and it's a concern every single day. And the bus, um, the, the privately owned, you know, bus department hasn't made any adjustments. Um, so there's that. I'm wondering if the police department or the fire department or whomever would be in charge of determining whether or not that's a safe entry and exit has been consulted. Have they been consulted? Yes, they have been contacted. We haven't had any official findings from them yet. Again, that's something when more concrete plans come into play, they will be submitting their uh, their feedback. We have, they are one of the most important, I mean, every board's important, but that's a huge point for us that we have to consider and we'll consider their input. But we haven't had any kind of formal submit, uh, submissions from them yet at this time. Okay. Um, and then when will this be heard by the, I, you may not know, but <clears throat> by the um, Conservation Commission? When will that happen? Is that, it just in procedure-wise, I don't know. Yep, so they have been contacted, um, and we haven't heard anything from them directly as to when they are planning on putting it on their agenda. Um, that is something that I would say, until we hear otherwise, uh, to stay tuned for the town website and, um, and Facebook and any kind of postings of groups that they have to see when they post their agendas and when they'll be discussing it. But they haven't told us any concrete dates as to when they do plan on discussing it. That'll be up to them and how often they meet and what else is on their agenda. Okay. Um, then we'll, I'm gonna, I have to go, but I can just contact you and get the site visit date. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. If, if you feel comfortable, um, if you don't want to put it on that sheet, you don't have to, but if you want to leave us with um, your, your phone number, if that's how you'd rather be contacted, that's fine. Oh, or email, whatever way you prefer to be contacted. I'll just contact the zoning board. Okay, sure. That, that's fine. All right, thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Bob Perry. Uh, to correct a statement made earlier, uh, on Pine Street, the elementary school bus does not go up Sylvia Way. Now, Sylvia Way was accepted uh, as a town road during this uh, past school year, but the elementary school bus does not go up that road as of the end of school year. So to the point of, uh, I think that needs to be considered if this new development is to go forward. We shouldn't have kids getting on the bus, particularly elementary school kids, getting on the bus on 138. But just to correct that point again, uh, the elementary school bus does not go up so we wait. The kids get off on the end of the uh, road on Pine Street. Thank you. I know it doesn't go up next door. I just told you to get on that. No, again, it does not because I pick up my grandson every day there and it, they drop the kids off on Pine Street. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Is it all you had, sir? Is there anything else? That's it? Okay.
Is there anybody else that wishes to be heard? Good evening, I'm Dave Rose. I'm with the Parks and Rec Commission. I'm also a member of the Town River Watershed Alliance, and I think we have another member this evening that may want to speak. We also have a representative of the Native Indian population, Mr. Rachel. Is that right? You may want to speak this evening. Um, I've heard um, what I've heard this evening is just so much wrong. It's hard to know where to begin. Uh, but I noticed that the board members were very careful in many of their responses and inquiries. So thank you very much for that. It shows a great deal of thought, and, uh, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, I would ask the town's attorney to send a letter to the governor and ask relief from the from the town of Dighton having to uh, be subject to 40 housing at all going forward. There's just so much wrong here, and it's, uh, it's completely out of control. So, um, I, it, it's, again, I'm not going to take up your whole evening this. Just, it's just so, so much is so wrong, it, it's difficult to know where to begin. We had a gentleman talk about traffic patterns. He talked about government studies. I, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I worked for the government a long time. I'm not sure I want to bet my life on anything the government has to say. So, uh, uh, and he talked about models and assumptions. He didn't really tell you what the estimates, what the assumptions were that support the estimates, other than a homogenized model from across the country. And I would suggest to you that Dighton is not, is not like Arizona. Dighton is not like Alaska. Dighton is not like Wyoming. Dighton is not like Cambridge, Massachusetts. So if he has some models that are much more specific to us, then perhaps we'll listen. But we're still, you know, at, at, at a much higher level. So much has gone so wrong. It's, it's hard to imagine how do you begin to fix this problem. So <clears throat> uh, I have to say that hearing the attorney speak and some of the others, I, I imagine myself for a moment to be in a, a town in Poland in 1944 when some gentleman in a dark suit with silver trim stands up and asks the local town committee which color he'd like the train painted so they wouldn't object to people being transported across Poland. Yeah, we, we, that, we can the 40B and talk about All right. So I'm just saying, here. yes, thank you. I'm done. And, and uh, I just appreciate your questions and inquiries. But they're, they're so misrepresenting what is happening. I'll mention. The Homeowners Association represents another level of government. You have no idea what that Homeowners Association is going to vote for. They may vote not to display the American flag in any of the homes in that. So I suggest, I am encouraging not to accept anything that involves a Homeowners Association. Thank you. I did when Mr. Rosen brings the clipboard back. Hello, my name is Brian Vasquez. Now a resident of Dighton. This is my first official Dighton meeting. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank the board. Also, you uh, you had some great um, questions. I was very happy to hear that my town board asked many of the questions that I was thinking of myself. Um, so, does that mean listening to everybody on both sides here? Does that mean the town? position right now is that we can take a 5% increase in water draw from the town system? At this point, yes. You believe that's possible and won't affect uh, supply of clean water or hydrant pressures, everyone says, and your engineers have confirmed what they said? They have not confirmed yet. Okay. So we're once we're pending water flow tests and all that okay. stuff in, in October. And, and, and unlike some people, I very much trust scientists. I, I am one myself. And, and I, uh, I'm I'm happy to hear that we have some peer review processes going on because we just came off a very wet spring and we're in a partial water bin. So uh, that, that's that's sort of interesting. Uh, uh, maybe we're just I, being conservative. I'm though, why we have that. Yep. It's, it's that we have, we have plenty of water. But Good. It's the fact that we're making the clean water every day for all the residents. So that may be the, the limiting factor in right. a 5% increase right. if we had at least a three bedroom apartment. They fill every one of those, assuming two, one, one. That's four people times 94 was the original when I did my calculations. That's approximately a 5% increase in town population. So can we make 5% increase our water, clean water output by 5% at the completion of this? So that was one question I had. The other question I had was with the traffic. Um, 
and, and I do work with models. I'm cool with models, and, and I trust the government more than most anything else. Um, my question, though, is I hope these models aren't based on hundreds of data points, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points. Because those of those who work with population models know that um, all of them are wrong, but some of them are useful. So um, it's nice that we have ideas of who's going north and south. And 35 cars added to either side of Center Street, light, that's a big deal. If, if you count how many cars are there now in peak traffic. But, we, uh, um, but that's 138 and Center Street. So Center Street in the evening is quite a, a miserable light to get stuck at now, too. So that would be my other question. What is the effect right there? I think that's going to affect a lot of townspeople. Moving quickly, uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Karen, uh, quickly a map from NAGSP. That's the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. So that's uh, a priority habitat map, I'm sure. And I bet you that property, now that I see it, is a map for at least box turtles and spotted turtles. I hope either you or working with the Conservation Commission is going to require some mitigation around, not only during construction, but around these roadways, uh, underpasses and, and, and exclusion zones. Th those are both protected species in the state. Um, and I, I really hope to be at this site walk because I want to see what's on that property myself. I'm very well versed with walking through brush. Um, those may have been all my questions, I thank the board for their time. Sure, thank you. Anybody else who would like to be heard? My name is Raja Gray Farns Disroaches. I'm with the Royal House of the Poconokins. That is Massasoit's tribe. And, and also the Poconokin Nation. My concern is that there could possibly be a village up there up to 7,000 to 8,000 years ago. There were many villages in this time. And we are doing research now to make sure there wasn't one there, and we will be going further research. And I would highly recommend that when they start moving the earth, that they have an archaeologist there. This whole area is very sensitive to Native American villages. Um, just so you know, that is part of the, um, one of the things that are required to submit, they are supposed to um, go for the Mass um, Historical Commission and to uh, the, and the heritage and to um, have them give some uh, findings as to what that um, part of the uh, state has to say about the land as well, too. So that is something that they do have to have to submit to us as well. Ed, so, you know, Bell, Ed Bell, that's head of uh, Mass Historical. I called up, but he's, he's on vacation right now. He's not coming back until the 9th of September. And I will be talking to him then. And in the meantime, we're going to continue with our research. I thank you very much. Commissioner, are you uh, sign in? Do you have not already? Thank you. Um, before we turn it over to the developer to address any of the town's concerns, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Uh, so I see your hand here and a hand back there. Uh, excuse me, sir, in the back. Did you want to speak? Yeah, it's alright. I was going to ask, when was the water table? No, just uh, up to the microphone, sorry, thank you. Oh, my name is John Fournier, and when was the water table checked? At the time of the season? Was it a wet time? Was it uh, January? Was it. Um, yeah, I'm just curious when they actually did the testing for all the, uh, for the ground water. And, Okay, sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, sir, if you could just uh, sign in here, I just thank you. Uh, so the engineers can point out the plans that are available online do include all of our soil logs, uh, which are holes that we, we dig in the soil uh, to determine the soil characteristics and where seasonal high groundwater is. It's not necessarily done during any particular time of the year. Um, Seasonal high groundwater is determined based on lines that you can see in the soil that are caused by rust. They're called models. So uh, we use those lines in the soil to determine where seasonal high groundwater is year after year after year. So it's not necessarily done during a particular time of year, but you can look 
uh, and the information to see exactly when those soil tests were completed. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who would speak? Sure. It was, yes, we do have it. Yeah. Uh, I, I did also hear, and I, I apologize, that uh, I didn't get it to you until Monday. Uh, you had asked for it at the last hearing, and as I was preparing for my week, I realized I hadn't done it in the future. I'll try to have things to you sooner so that you don't have to have time pressure. It's just because of the, the length of the document, we appreciate you more all, all kind of feedback, but in order to have some of us who have full-time jobs in the family, we just need them more time. Yeah, sure, understood. Thank you. Uh, look, my real takeaway is that in order to do an evaluation of what's going to fit on this site, you've got to know what's there. The plan that you have, that's the approved um, ORAD, uh, there, are, there are two things that happened in the wetland permitting uh, arena. One of them is you can confirm resource boundary lines. That's what you do on a plan. That is just uh, you know, setting where agreeing publicly for three years, this is where the boundaries are. The limits of an ORAD are that the Conservation Commission only confirms the wetlands that the applicant asks for. In this case, they asked for the what are called jurisdictional. That is, wetlands that are um, governed by the State Wetland Protection Act. And they include things like bordering vegetated wetlands, BPWs, uh, and, and certain other things. I don't dispute that those lines are accurate as shown on the plan. What I referenced last time and what I submitted to you a few days ago is the Commission's own finding its own report that says, it literally checks a box that says inaccurate, and that may be misleading, so let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that the applicant has done anything that's inaccurate on the plan. What's inaccurate is the plan contains what, I'm sorry, the site contains wetlands that aren't shown on the plan. Now, let me just explain with wetlands the second thing that conservation commissions do. So one is they confirm boundary lines on a plan called an ORAD. They also approve work near wetlands, and that's done through an NOI process. Now, applicants have the ability to elect how and when they choose to ask for wetland permits. In this case, two years ago, or almost two years ago, they asked for the delineation and they got their ORAD, which shows certain of the wetlands on the site. What they haven't done yet, what they must still do, is go through the NOI process at the Conservation Commission. In the meantime, they will be asking you to waive certain local wetland protections. My point is that in order to make a, a good judgment about whether those should or can be waived, you need to know what they are and where they are. Now, if I hadn't been through this myself on this same site, I wouldn't be so emphatic about it. And in other communities, frankly, it has successfully be, been done the way they're proposing it, where they come in with an ORAD, and that just tells you where certain lines are, and then they get a comp permit, and then they go back to the CONCOM for an NOI. So I'm not, there's nothing unlawful or unreasonable about that per se. What is unreasonable is for this town, which spent a lot of money 
on the last iteration of the project from a different developer. These guys had nothing to do with that. Because the board, probably before any of you were on it, didn't go through the, the process that I'm recommending, which is get a wetland plan that shows everything, including the wetland resources that you're going to be asked to waive that are only protected under your, under your local bylaw. The reason to do that is if you're going to be considering different iterations of the project, different types of housing and location, you first have to know where's the wetland, what kind of wetland is it, what is the applicable buffer, is it 25 feet, is it 100 feet, all of that information. The only thing that you have now on the ORAD are things that you have no power over anyway. Those are state-regulated resource areas. You couldn't waive them if you wanted to. So that's my position on the wetlands. I, yes, sir? A lot of things you're talking about right here is really nothing to do with the zoning part of our property. That's conservation. Their biggest hurdle is going to be conservation, which they still got to go around on that matter. So I, I appreciate everything you're bringing to us, but that's not what the zoning that we're here for today. I understand what you're up against, I understand what you're talking about, and I'm glad you brought it to our attention on that, but that's a conservation matter, not a, not a zoning matter. Where your pools are. Unfortunately, this is the way the process works before it gets to conservation. I understand you're trying to stop before we get there, we can't do that as for conservation, so. Well, I, I don't need to suggest that it would stop. I understand what you're saying, but bring everything back to this, so let's regroup and start again. That would be something that Bishop and the attorneys and you, as for them, would have to go with our conservation. Hold your case with them in front of that matter. Because what you're talking about is running pools, locations of wetlands, setbacks of wetlands, things like that. It's all conservation. What we do at this board is strictly, as you well know, is setbacks of properties, how big the house lot's going to be, how big the road's going to be, how wide the sidewalk's going to be. That's what we're going to be designing on this matter. Yes, and you raise a good point, because in that consideration, one thing that you ought to know is, does the road go through a buffer zone? And right now, the plan that you have doesn't show all the information that you would need to know. Now, hopefully, when you ask for comments from the Conservation Commission, they might actually shed more light on that. Uh, they certainly know the site better than anybody. Um, uh, if I could just turn to a couple of other things very quickly. Uh, on, on the issue of the sewer, which just came up tonight, uh, one thing I can tell you is that given the size of the project, uh, you're, you're talking about um, you know, flows of above 31,000 gallons per day, which if you peak it is 124,000 gallons. It's a significant size uh, consideration perhaps by the sewer department ought to be given to how I and I is to be mitigated under uh, state law. Any new connection over 15,000 gallons per day requires at least a four to one mitigation of I and I inflow and infiltration. And if, if the sewer department is gonna retain its own engineer to do capacity, that's something you might ask that infrastructure engineer to, to calculate. Um, the, uh, the point that, that the, uh, the gentleman just made about the uh, archaeology, this morning I was actually on a site visit with an archaeologist for another 40B project, and my one comment about that, I, I don't represent those folks, but it's very uh, inexpensive and very easily done. If you have the applicant's permission, could retain an archaeologist for $119 an hour. The guy was there for one hour with his metal detector and his probe. And my, my recommendation is that's something that you can find out now. And if there is a, what they call a culturally sensitive site, you can mitigate by having it excavated uh, early on or protected. Uh, because the problem is once plans are approved, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to do that. Um, unless there are other questions, that's all I have. Anything here on the board? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
Okay, so is there anything specific the developer would like to answer uh, to any of the abutters concerns or any of the other findings that we have tonight before we discuss um, any potential new design plans? No, I, I think you can just assure everyone we're continuing to, to listen and as we said at the beginning, the plans you know, will likely to continue to evolve um, and we'll listen to what the board has to say about potentially evolving towards something that includes different building technology. Actually, one question I have regarding uh, your application. Um, the component having to do is the submitting to the Mass Historical and the uh, Heritage Committee. The, what was submitted in our binder was just the fact that you guys had submitted an application to them. Have you heard anything back from them at all? No, we haven't received anything back. Okay. Okay, so at the time, uh, this time before we um, ask the developer, kind of no pun intended, to go back to the drawing board with any potential new plans, what um, should we be considering? I want to hear everything that we can, um, so that just so when they leave here tonight, they have a very clear idea of what it is that we are looking for. Is there anything specific? Yeah, just a anything uh, specific that we want the developer to um, take into consideration when devising a new plan for new, ho uh, new housing types. Because this is going to drastically change uh, I mean, I'm not an engineer, but what we have before us, so I think it's something that the board should con uh, the board should be considering as to what it is we are asking of them to include in those new plans or what factors we want them to be addressing. Uh, just make sure you have a microphone, John, on this one. Uh, we'll, have, we'll, we'll get one down to you. So, if you're going to consider other proposals with regard to that same site, what I'd like to know are a number of things. First of all, if you're proposing other types of units, what are the other types of units? Are they going to be townhouses? Are they going to be condominiums? Condominiums? Will all of these be for sale units? Will some be rental units? Um, what percentages you would propose for each component of the project to be 40 b in terms of the affordable numbers, the 25% cap, or do you, are you going to go 30, 20 in another area to try and make that work? Um, obviously, what would the cost factors be for potential rent, and, and as well as uh, what you're looking at for figures for the affordable units, if that might change in terms of this, whether you're looking at one large development with different types of components to it, or you're looking at several smaller developments now with different homeowners associations, and how that linkage would happen in terms of common area and common space, including the roads and so forth. I'd also be looking at the types of units that you're you're suggesting for um, seniors potentially, which means are you looking at a uh, single floor, are you looking at two or three floor units depending upon height restrictions, with elevator or stairs only, how that's going to affect potential ramp space in terms of what might be needed for housing for people with disabilities or for seniors <coughs> as well, whether that's going to affect the size of the unit and that would affect parking and drive up for those types of units because of people with disabilities or seniors who can't get to you know, a driveway or a parking lot that's further away potentially. Those are just some of the things that I would want to know if, you, if you're looking for something like this. Um, would you be able to, for example, if you're considering a development that is going to have some specific aspects towards seniors as the population of the town gets older, does that mean, are you looking for a specific area of the development to set aside for seniors, which would be on one level easier for them to navigate, but on the other level, they may not want to be isolated out? Something to think about. Same thing for units that have disability access, potentially. Are you willing and to make certain types of units in each of your types of developments accessible for people with disabilities? And I don't mean somebody like myself who's visually impaired, necessarily, but people who might need wheelchair access. Are you willing to consider specifically making any of your units available for current town residents or future residents who might need wheelchair accessibility? Because that means everything in the unit, as I'm sure you know, changes in terms of size and space and doorways and so forth. Those are just a few of the questions I have. I could keep on going, but um, I gotta stop someplace. Um, okay, and uh, Marguerite, is there anything you wish to share this time? I'm 
developer is. I've certainly been taking notes, and I have my own set of questions that I'll share with the board at the time that we're ready to have more of a concrete plan in front of us. All right, Peter, anything you want to add? No. Michelle? Jason? I mean, do we want to... No, I'm fine. Do we want to... I would like to see a plan, a potential plan, that includes town halls. Um, yeah, to town houses. Yeah, I just want to make sure, yeah. I'm not opposed, I'm not for, I, I just want to see what what it would play out and look like. But at the same time, I also would like to see, going back to the wetlands, I'm kind of not confused, but I want to know more where the wetlands are on that whole property, on all, all the acreage, um, and see where that lines up with all the other potential <coughs> areas where we do town hall or single town, whatever it is. Hey. So, uh, I mean, as Attorney Mitchell pointed out early, the developer has this sort of chicken and egg problem, okay? Before we develop a plan with any level of specificity, we want to know whether or not we're going in the right direction. So the, the very simple question that we would present to the board and the very signal we would like to hear from the board is whether there is a consensus in town, a feeling in town, or identification of a local need or a local concern to vary the type of housing typology that you have in Dighton. Does Dighton generally, or, or is the signal from this board, or is this board's feeling generally that Dighton could use a few more townhomes, Dighton could use a few more condominiums? If we get that very basic signal from the board, then I think at that point we might go in that direction and present a plan and start to go off on that tangent and develop a plan that addresses those and then addresses all the detailed questions that Mr. Gale had. Uh, so it's that very basic question. If there's no interest in varying housing typology, we won't go in that direction. We didn't propose that, and, and that's the trick that Attorney Mitchell pointed out. We can only propose one plan at a time. Uh, so the plan before the board is single family. The feedback we received from various uh, town officials, at least preliminarily from a few members of the board, is yeah, there might be a need for varying housing typology. Whether it be condos, whether it be townhouses, you know, and then if there is a desire for it, we'll go in that direction. Um, I know for me there is absolutely a desire for that. Uh, it's something as I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my late 20s, I'm considering, yeah, there are people like myself who want to settle in town, and there's also elderly who wish to stay in town. So I definitely am looking for something that is geared towards both um, I know in the past, I'm not trying to think about past developments, but people consider, oh, what if it's all 65 and older? Like to me, that's not anything that's viable right now. I would want people to come into town as well. We have to keep you know, the cycle going. Um, before I be more specific, I guess my question is, what exactly are um, cottage-style homes? That's one thing that um, Mar uh, Mallory has listed, and I know Fisher has expressed that as well. I'm just, for my ignorance, I'm just not exactly sure what a cottage-style home is. I can give my understanding of it, but I for a Fisher to describe what, what that type might be. Okay, thank you. Very style home, and, and I'm happy to, once we make a, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to present the proposals, uh, but once we make that uh, uh, presentation or that proposal to you, we'll, we'll uh, show you pictures and websites that you can go to of projects that we have done. A kind of style home is a, a, a home, a single family condominium, it has, it's a single family, uh, uh, but it's on, on a commonly owned property, land, and it has a, an outside, outdoors patio, a uh, fenced in patio, so that the homeowner can go, uh, do not, does not have to maintain his, his lawn or, or, but yet they have outdoors uh, facility. It's, it's very much similar to the, <coughs> Methodist camp in, in, in Martha's Vineyard. Oh, okay. okay. You know, where you have you have a you know you have a home. It's single. It's you don't have, you're not touching the, the neighbor, but you are the your next door next door neighbor is 15 feet away. It's 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 a concept that's uh, that's been uh, very prevalent out west. That's making its way here. We have actually three projects uh, developments like that going on right now. And I'm happy to, you can, you can, I'm happy to be addresses, you can drive by them and see them. I'm happy to also, we have a, a fly-in uh, video on it that will give you a 
website, you can go see it online. And we, we will share all that information with you. And in addition to the townhouses and the condos, I think it makes for a nice, more more vibrant, more dynamic mixture in the neighborhood. That's, that's what I'm looking for. I don't know, I can't speak on behalf of the board, but I, I certainly am absolutely for more of a dynamic mixture. Not just for the aesthetic appeal, but as for the different types of people that are looking to, to, to purchase and stay in town. So I think that, um, first of all, part of it, I said this at, at the last meeting as well, so if it, who, those of you who were here at the last meeting heard this, in terms of, as they say, full disclosure, I've only been in this town for a few years. I did come into the town through a 40B development process, and that worked, and has worked very, very well for me and my family. Having said that, just so that everybody is aware, I will also say that for the purposes of these hearings and everything that is being done, I am not a voting member. As a member of the committee, I have the right to participate and ask questions, but I have accused myself from that process because I've come in through the board 40B process, and it's, it's important to, to make that distinction, at least for me. Having said that, I think it's also important for people to realize the question that was just asked by the attorney was the type of housing that the town needs or might be looking for. And there's a report that we have to fill out every so many years for the state called SERPIT. It's a SERPIT report, which is, oh my gosh, I think this one was 100 pages. But basically, it talks about the population growth of the town, the way the town is heading in terms of age factors, things like that. So what's become clear is that the age of the town in terms of its residents is for ev every single day, literally, we're getting older and older. The population of the town is older. There are a large number of seniors in the town. There were a very large number of people in the town who were veterans as well. Um, in some cases, it's disproportionate to a lot of other towns, which is not a bad thing, but there are a lot of veterans in the town who are going to be needing other forms of housing because they can't maintain their homes. There's only a small number of senior housing right now in the town, as, as people know. Public housing in this town is, is at a minimum right now. Everything is filled. There are nowhere else for those seniors to go. There are also if people who sell their homes in this town right now who are seniors or older or have disability. There is nowhere for them to go in the town that they can afford. So when we look at the circuit plan for a 40B process, keep in mind that whether we like it or not, every single town in the Commonwealth ultimately has to meet a 10% goal for affordable housing through the 40B process one way or another. Every time we add 100 people to the town, or 10 people to the town, or so many homes to the town, that just puts us further and further away from that target. We're under the gun in that if we don't work towards achieving those targets, then we run the risk of losing other services and resources from the state and potentially even the federal government. So whether the town likes the concept of these types of projects or not, the town is bound by having to accept these types of projects. Some residents like it. It's more diverse. Excuse me, did I, did I, did I think I just, I, I understand the point you're trying to make, but we do have to, I do want to stick to making sure the developer has a clear. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say to the developer is, the question was, you know, what type of housing are you looking for? So if you keep in mind the types of things that we have to consider in the future for the town development, hopefully that gives you an answer to what type of development we'd like to see. Is there anything more you're looking for us? No, I, I got a good sense from the chairman uh, and uh, Mr. Gale. I, I heard preliminarily there was some concerns about long-term maintenance. I, I, I think just, my, one of my couple of my concerns is it doesn't call the town. It's actually two places, correct? You have two homes, two separate homes in one home. Is that what we're looking to do? So you have a making sure. No, and, and again, so we haven't even come up with it yet. Okay. okay, I think if there's a desire for it, and you're, if your concern, if your only concern is uh, long-term maintenance, whatever we come back with is going to answer that. We're going to have answers for that if we go that route. And, and you know, harmony amongst the I'm just the saying in town, we have a couple that I know of. So we have a duplex, and this tenant over here needs a roof, this tenant doesn't do a roof. This house gets painted blue. This house. Seen those houses? It's, yeah. It's just a nightmare, and I don't think Titan's ready for that person. I know. Easily addressable, 
in the context of this type of project. Right, so Easily you're addressed. townhouse, we're talking about a single family, two story, three bedroom, side by side. Sorry, say that again? You're talking about a two story townhouse. Whatever ultimately we put on a plan, okay? Yeah. It, it would be a condominium, okay? Or it would be subject to a homeowners association. So that one owner could not paint one side blue, the other owner could not paint it yellow, and it looks like a mishmash, okay. okay? One roof cannot fall into disrepair. The point of cottages, okay? The owner doesn't have to worry about any of that. They pay their condo fee, and the condo fee takes care of the maintenance for the, mm -hmm. the structural elements, the right. exterior appearance. All they have to do is pay their condo fee, and the paint in is their responsibility. And, and you know, the, the mechanics that control the house. But the visual appearance is, is spoken for. So if, if that question is resolved, do you agree generally with the typology concern of very, okay, if we can address it. So whatever we come back with, if we were to come back with something, we'll have info on that. Is there any more kind of direction you feel like you guys need to be I know our answers were all kind of varied, but is there anything more specific? I mean, no, I think ultimately we will take that back. This has been helpful. Okay. okay. Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes. So, just before I ask a couple of questions, or before I make a statement about that, let me ask a couple of questions. How many members of the board have ever been or are currently? have a license as a real estate agent or broker? One. Okay. So, anybody on the board ever have a, you know, a degree in marketing or ever took marketing courses as part of an undergraduate study? All right. We'll just leave that alone for a minute and say, the, the gentleman, whether it's houses or anything else, in a fashion, they're inviting you to join them in their plan. I encourage you to guard against them. Secondly, they're supposed to come to you and say, here's the market for housing. Here's what sells, and here's why it sells. And this is why we're gonna build, we are proposing to build these types of houses. And right now, I wanna spit blood because I may have actually helped them. So that's what they should be uh, saying to you, and, and they should be telling you why and where those types of housing are selling and why they, why it fits the price model that they're talking about. And th that's why we've contacted the, uh, the time administrator and she's given her input. That is part of her job. I'm sorry, you contacted who? The time administrator. That is part of her job. Uh, and I, I have a great discussion. deal of respect for the time administrator, although I have you know, a number of disagreements with her perhaps, but I'm not sure she should be making any comments about that. They propose to be the experts. They propose to be in the business. They should be the ones telling talking to you about that, not you talking to them about it. Which they Which did, and then the time after that is part of her job, is on her end to do that. To and, you know, I'll just add this for you as a youngster coming up, and congratulations, you know, you have your future in front of you. Um, part of the reason you have a constriction on the number of houses available is because there is a restriction on the size of a house lot and on frontage on paved streets. If you re remember this term, Snob zoning, that's what that reflects. You do that kind of zoning to restrict growth. If you want more growth, you want to build more homes, then you have to bid. The town has to back away from those sort of restrictions. That will pr probably, if you do, wherever you can, that will probably go a long way to easing the housing market. And you may be able to jump in a lot sooner than you currently think you can. Thank you, have a good night. Okay, so before we um, discuss uh, the site visit, um, a date for that, is there anything else before we wrap up? No? Okay, so one date that I, if, uh, I'm looking at for the um, September 10th, which is a Tuesday. Um, obviously, the later we go into the year, um, the, you know, the daylight is going to wrap up sooner, so I'm looking to get this done before you know, we lose that daylight, obviously we have to consider that a lot of people who will be attending this will be working. Um, uh, so, so, I'm looking at September 10th, the Tuesday, um, 
uh, at 6 p.m. and then something that you guys spoke on behalf of before is ahead of time trying to gather some type of a quote unquote RSVP so you guys know what kind of and how amount of a, what amount of transportation to provide. Are you looking for a certain like, you know, X amount of days before so you can plan? Well, what were you thinking when you proposed that? Yeah, well, we're going to have one car that can seat, you know, four adults. Um, okay. But I think if we could have people that are interested give the ZBA secretary a call 48 hours in advance, and then we follow up with the ZBA secretary the night before and say, how many people have you heard from? All right? We will do our best to accommodate. And you're, in, you're looking at just the number of residents that are looking for transportation, because some live within Walk, reasonable right. walking distance. Obviously, right. we don't need to hear back from them if they plan on attending. It's only those who say, I would like to go, I don't have any means of getting there, I don't know where to park, exactly. uh, I'm looking for transportation. Exactly. Okay, so that being said, um, if we're looking at the 10th, uh, 48 hours would put us at Sunday. Um, the 8th, obviously that's not feasible for that kind of deadline. Town Hall is closed on the 6th, which is the Friday. Um, we're looking at um, Thursday the 5th would be the deadline to contact. Uh, the office manager as to if you do plan on attending and if you need, uh, only if you need any kind of transportation so we can get that back to them as well. Does that work for you guys? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'm going to, uh, that was in the details. I'm going to suggest that if everyone is willing, I hate to do this, um, I'm wondering if Saturday morning would be better. And the reason I'm saying that is because we have high uh, warnings up for mosquitoes and so forth in the best time and for some of the residents and many of the residents that might be a concern, especially if they just come off a period of eight or something. So I don't know if the residents or the developers. Okay, so uh, I'm personally new to the whole 40B experience, obviously, so I don't know if typically that is something we do. So I visit on, on weekends. I don't know if that's something that you guys are accustomed to, what your schedules are like. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm for or against that. I'm just curious. It's, it's whatever the schedule allows. Is that okay, okay for you? We would like to have the engineer or, or one of the engineers present just to kind of identify what has been staked because we, we do state the road. Sorry, Mr. Yes. Uh, Margaret made a uh, suggestion that we at the town hall not here. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was planning on. I mean, there's a lot, a lot closer for. Um, if, if it's just Saturday, I mean, I can't attend. I mean, as long as one, I would like at least one of the three so, uh, voting members to attend. So uh, I usually work Saturday mornings. That's a little short for me to get off from work. Will either of you be able to attend if we do a Saturday morning? Um, it looks like a lot. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of you. No, no, I don't mean to say it that way. But um, Saturdays are out. Unless we do Saturdays in October, but that's what I'm now. Now we're getting later into the year. That's going to be after. If you do any Saturdays in October, that's going to be after the workshop and after the last public. I mean, after the next public hearing. September 12th. Well, I mean, that's a Tuesday. I mean, Thursday. We were talking about with the idea of a possible Saturday. I just, I know that's. Okay. It, 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 it looks like right right now, Saturdays, Jonathan, I'm sorry, but are, are, are not going to be feasible. I, I understand your concern. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that was the 10th of Tuesday. Yeah, we, 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 can, do, we can do the Thursday, though. The 12th was scheduled for the 10th. Yep, that's right, that's right, John, uh, Jason. So the 10th. Tuesday, 6 p.m. will be the site visit. RSVP a week. Uh, uh, Nicole would like a week before, so that would be two, uh, Tuesday the third. So if we could have any residents, I'm sorry for the confusion, but uh, that'd be uh, Tuesday, September third, would be the deadline to contact the office manager if you would like transportation to the site visit. And that would be meeting at, at town hall. Um, what, uh, 
Fisher, for, for you guys, for your cars, where would we appropriate for, uh, to, to meet? Yeah, we're, we're in town hall. I just want the residents to know where to go. Rear entrance behind the parking lot behind. Okay, the rear entrance, the, the, the lower rear entrance uh, for town hall will be the meeting spot um, on uh, September 10th, 6 p.m. for anybody need transportation. You want to do so. The site will begin, begin at six, five forty-five meeting at the town hall, and then it's um, for any residents looking for transportation. So do we, do we have to send out notices, like formal notice, requesting all these meetings, and then posted all that kind of stuff? No, I mean I think this is enough that we're stating for the public that we need to RSVP by. I mean that's. Mr. Chairman. Yes. So tonight, uh, <laughs> the conclusion of the meeting, because that's going to be a public meeting, so it will be posted, and you can put those details in the posting. Um, my suggestion will be that whoever will be making the motion to continue will make a motion to continue to September 10th at 6 p.m. for the site visit, RSVP to town hall. Um, by September 3rd, if you need a ride and plan to meet at the lower entrance, rear entrance of town hall by 545, and to continue to September 12th for the work session, and to continue to October, I'm sorry, both of those times are at 6 p.m. and September 10th and September 12th, and Tuesday, October 15th at 7 p.m. at the Dighton Middle School for the continued public hearing. So those would be, that would be the motion I would suggest that you make. Uh, all three of those meetings will be public yes, meetings, absolutely. and they will be posted with the details. Okay, do I have a motion, please? <laughs> so moved. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Before we adjourn tonight, any more last quick final thoughts? From the public? From the, no? I just wanted to state for the record, all of the packets that are presented here um, are posted on our website under the zoning board. Um, my office has moved to the uh, town hall instead of the old town hall. I'm uh, sharing an office with the planning board. Um, my office hours are from eight to one, um, but on Thursdays after meetings, I won't be there because I'm, I'm working with 20 hours, but um, you can always reach out to me if you have any questions coming up to any of the meetings and I will be posting any of the meetings, site visits, and everything else outside of my office uh, on the lower level, and also with the clerk and on our website. So please reach out to me with any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adjourn, please? Make a motion to adjourn. A second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>